I am here with Rob Cameron, BBC correspondent for the Czech Republic and Slovakia, based here in Prague. Hello, Rob. Hello, Derek. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you very much. I am uh, working from home. I'm an old hand at working in my box of shorts and making tea when I need to work and all that, definitely. <laughs> exactly. All right, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Cameron for coming on Prague Times today and thank everybody out there for listening. A city is much more than just a collection of buildings. It's a location, it's a history, it's a culture, it's ideas and ideals, and a city is also, most importantly, the people in it. This is Prague Times, the podcast that takes a look at the city of Prague in the Czech Republic. With more than a thousand years of history, there's a lot to talk about. We'll talk about the past of Prague, but we'll also talk about the city as it is today, future plans for the city, and much more. It's Prague then, Prague now, and Prague later. And this is Prague Times. So you first came here when? Back in the 90s, right? I first visited in 1992, uh, in the summer of 92, with a few friends. We took a bus over from London. So that was my first experience of the Ch of Czechoslovakia as it was then. It wasn't Prague. In fact, we spent less than one night in Prague. It was most of it in the countryside in Bohemia. So, I mean, go back then, of course, uh, Prague was, well, it was an interesting place, <laughs> right? It was. It was wild, wasn't it? I mean... <laughs> When I first came here, I was kind of shocked by the city and how beautiful it was underneath all the disrepair and the grime. I knew nothing about this place when I got here. Uh, I was in a slightly different position simply because my folks had been here in the 1970s, drove all the way through Germany into communist Czechoslovakia in the midst of kind of normalization and then went back. Uh, one thing that they left in me sort of very at a very early age, apparently, uh, was a fascination with this country. And my mum actually to this day still says that when you were a kid and when we, people say, where's your mom and dad? And I would say, they're in Czechoslovakia. And I was absolutely obsessed with this name. It started from there, and it's been a sort of a love affair on and off that was, I suppose, started then and, and then um, kindled, if not rekindled, in, in 92, and has been there ever since. Wow. So you're sort of like Czech at heart. You know, I kind of am. Almost half of my immediate family live here. I have two kids here. My partner is French, not Czech, but I've just been here so long um, that I just, uh, I don't consider myself Czech, but, uh, you know, culturally and socially, I think at least half of me now has beer and, and goulash running through his veins rather than anything else. <laughs> So, uh, so you you became the BBC correspondent based here in Prague. What in two thousand and four when we joined the EU? Uh, yes, it was uh, around about that time. Yeah, I mean, basically, just I visited in ninety two. I moved in ninety three. Like everybody, I had no qualifications, no idea what I was doing, and no idea about how the world worked. Despite a degree in history and politics. So I was clueless when I came here. I had um, absolutely nothing to offer. Uh, I had no teaching qualifications. I had some money saved. I quickly ran through that and sort of burnt my visa card. I then realized I probably should get a job. I started going to the same kind of language schools that um, my friends uh, were you know, doing the rounds of in Prague. Um, and I swear to God, I walked into a language school. The interview went as follows. He said, uh, so Rob, uh, you're American. I said, no, 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 I'm British. And he said, oh, but you speak English. I said, yes, I do. I do speak English. He said, when can you start teaching English? And I said, oh, I don't know. I think I could start as early as next month. And he said, yeah, Rob, could you start Monday? <laughs> and so I did with no English qualifications, no TEFL, not even the jokey TEFLs that you could do in Dublin um, over a weekend. I had nothing beyond English as my mother tongue. Within days, I was teaching both children and adults how to speak English. And I did a pretty 
bad job of it. But in that time, I, I learned Czech really quickly from my students. They seemed to enjoy teaching me Czech just as much as I was learning, uh, teaching them English. And so I learned Czech pretty quickly. And then after a few years, I got a job translating in the Czech news agency. So after a few years of that, I got a job at Radio Prague, which is the English service of Czech radio. And after a few years of that, I got the job at the BBC. So that's pretty much how it panned out. So it was just a series of kind of happy accidents and coincidences and lucky breaks and doors opening at the right time. You know, a, a bit of luck, a lot of luck, um, a lot of hard work as well. Let's, you know, I won't kid myself. And just a sort of passion and interest for everything to do with this country. And that's where I ended up. I think I think a lot of people who came here in the 90s have a very similar story mm. where it's almost just kind of like Prague or the country decided, yeah, you're okay. I'll, I'll, I'll smooth your path for you and make it a little bit easier for you. Because some people did not have, they, you know, some people had a bad time. Some people were like, I just can't seem to find an apartment that isn't, you know, horrible or whatever. And they didn't last very long. Yes, that is so true. Very true. But I think it's definitely, definitely truth in that, that Prague chooses you rather than the other way around. Yeah, that's just something I've I've often thought. Even now, when uh, people come for a visit, you know, it's I'm from San Francisco, California, and it's another one of those cities that is full of people who come on vacation on holiday, and then a couple of weeks later, they you know they've extended it, and then they just kind of contact their parents and say, "Hey, put my stuff in storage. I think I'm gonna just stay here, and uh, I'll meet people at the beer garden and." If everything's working out for him, I'll say, well, Prague wants you. I think that's very, it's, you know, you've nailed it, really. Yeah. Prague is happy to have you. Yes. And when it's not happy to have you, it, it will let you know. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, it's, it is a big city when all's said and done. So you got into journalism and the news business, which is kind of a, a lucky thing, actually, in many ways. I'd always wanted to be in the news business, even as a kid. I'd always wanted to become a journalist, and, I, and journalists were my idols. Foreign correspondents were my idols, and I read all the you know books by John Simpson and all the other luminaries of the BBC, and I wanted to be them. And then, so I did try and do that at the age of sort of 16, 17, 18. I tried to get into journalism college and failed, and I tried to get internships at the BBC and everywhere else and offered stuff to newspapers before I moved here and failed. And then I moved here and it just sort of worked out. Um, so that, that's really been how I, how I got into journalism, with no experience, just a lot of enthusiasm and, and the love for the trade. And, of course, you're a native English speaker, so that helped. <laughs> and then that helps. That helps a lot, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of us who live here we're in this kind of odd position where we kind of pay attention to the country we came from and we kind of pay attention to the Czech Republic. Yep. But I think for many of us, a part of it is the language barrier. But I, I think my Prague and your Prague is probably different than a Czech's Prague. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, ha having been here so long and just having now built a life for myself, which is so intimately linked to the politics of this country, you know, every time there is a debate in Parliament about, I don't know, what to teach kids in schools or how to treat a certain minority or how to address a certain social ill, I do feel now, now, not, not then, but now, I do feel it really does intimately affect me. So in that sense, I do feel Czech and I do follow the politics and I do follow all those debates closely, part of, partly because I have to for my job, but also I feel like this stuff affects me. If they pass this law, that will affect me, not as a foreigner, but as someone who lives here as a resident. So I don't feel so removed from it. In a sense, I'm really removed from it in, because I can't vote. Um, but apart from that, I do really feel connected to it. Right. What would, what would that entail? You'd have to become a citizen. I'd have to become a citizen, which is currently in process, I think would be the right phrase. <laughs> the wonderful Czech bureaucracy. Well, I applied in July last year, so there you go. Yeah. To be fair, there is the pandemic. To, just to just to add a little delay to it, yeah. Yeah, no, they got a little they got a little distracted. I know. I realize I'm not top of the list, but uh, it would be nice one of these days, guys, if we could sort it out before Brexit really hits. Yeah, boy, that's for sure. So was that the impetus for, hey, oh, it's time to get citizenship is, oh, Brexit's happening. Yeah, absolutely. I probably wouldn't have bothered if it hadn't. But because of that, simply for purely logistic reasons and just to give me the same rights as any other EU citizens living in this country and Czechs, I want I want to be Czech. I, I applaud you. <laughs> that doesn't happen very often, so thank you. 
Uh, obviously, you've been covering the news scene here and the political scene here and the social scene here for uh, quite a while now. What are what are some of the more interesting or maybe formative events uh, in the last 16 years uh, that you think have? Because the reason I ask this is I have seen a big change. I was here in the 90s. And then I left and I came back in early 2006. And even in this last tenure, I've seen the city, certainly, of Prague change rather dramatically since around 2012, 2013 is really when it started to shift. And I see now a very modern, very international, very cosmopolitan city. And I I wonder if you have any insight as to how that happened. Like, I have a couple of theories, but I don't really know why in 2010 it the joke was Prague is a collection of villages. And you went, ha ha, it kind of is actually. And then in 2015, it was a legitimate European capital of culture and cosmopolitanism. It's such a huge question. It's really hard to answer. And it's so subjective that different people are going to have different ideas as to when this happened. And if I can be so bold as to say, Derek, that I think people who leave and come back experience that more vividly because there's a more of a jolt. If you never leave, if you have never left, and I have never left. The most I've been outside the city is three weeks in 27 years, maybe four. But when you don't leave, the changes are so slow and so incremental that you don't really notice it. It's like, you know, a frog being boiled or whatever. You just don't notice. You just don't. I mean, I did, there are lots of things that I can say, this is changing, and this is changing, and this is better, and this is worse, and this is different. I can point at a million buildings and a million streets and say, OK, that used to be, you know, you used to be able to park there. Now it's trees. It's great. This place is way more pleasant. This is less pleasant. All those things. Uh, the, these people are nicer. This, this place has a different vibe. All that stuff. But you really have to sit down and think about it hard. And when, I, and when people do ask me, and, and they do, I really have to think about it. So I, unlike you, I can't put years or dates or periods to it. To me, it's all just a continuum that's very difficult for me to sort of break up into my brain. I just know it's it's happened. You're right, but I don't know when it happened or when it changed. And for me, it's still happening as well, in, in good ways and bad. Has it always been a city? Like, have you always enjoyed living here? No. <laughs> I suspected that might be the answer. <laughs> <laughs> my experience, I think, was fairly typical of most foreigners who make Prague their home. Most of them will have an amazing first year, second year, third year, maybe up to five. You'll have the most amazing time of your life, and it will really feel like the holiday that never ended, especially if you are, you know, 23 or whatever, however old I was when, when this happened to me. So in the early days, it just feels like a holiday. And th- But then, you know, when, when after a while, the shine does wear off. The classic example, and I'm sure you've experienced this, and I'm sure most people experience experience it is when their check gets to the point and this happens for different people at different times and it can happen to you after a year and it can happen to you after five years or ten years but when it happens it's a moment and it's the moment when you're sitting in the tram and your check gets good enough to realize that the people around you are not discussing Dvořák or Kafka or talking about the works of Václav Havel. They are either talking about how much the butter is at Lidl or they're making some egregiously offensive racist comment. It's not always bad, but there is a tendency for us Czech lovers to glorify the nation of the Czech people and just to assume this wonderful, fantastic nation of wonderful people were having these, you know, incredibly elevated, uh, inspiring conversations around me simply because I couldn't understand the language. And once you understand the language and you realize that the person on the 22 tram is probably having exactly the same conversation as someone on the bus to Finsbury Park or the subway in, in San Francisco, right? About, oh, yeah, no, we... Yeah, it's a lot of gossip, gossiping, complaining. It's gossiping and and you hear things that just make you realize just how alike we all are around the world to each other, that you do fall a little bit out of love with the country when and you begin to understand the language. But then at the same time, you simultaneously also discover things about the nation, about the people that make you fall in love a bit more with other bits of it. So it's a really complicated process. It's organic. What we're seeing now, of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic has caused uh, a lot of people to, I, some people I know have reassessed. Do I want to stay here? Should I st- Should I go back to where I'm from, et cetera, et cetera? You've gone ahead and actually on Facebook created a group called hashtag help your hood, uh, which is sort of a clearinghouse of information about what's going on with the COVID-19 uh, situation here in Prague and in the Czech Republic, an attempt to dispel the myths and 
and get accurate information out there and legitimate, helpful, constructive discussion. What made you do that? Well, it wasn't for those reasons. Um, I'll tell you that. It wasn't at all. It started off as something else, not entirely, but in, in the main. It was, it was a completely different project. It came to me back in March, March 17th, I think it was, Saturday, March 17th, if that was a Saturday. St. Patrick's Day, had you been drinking? Uh, I was definitely drinking. Well, I don't know if I was toasting that particular saint, but uh, it was simply occurred to me. And I think, you know, it, for all of us, for everybody around the world, it was just, just such a fraught, terrifying time that in those early days, none of us really knew where, you know, how fast this thing would begin to affect our lives and, and also how fast we would actually need help, right? And so I just assumed it would just be good to have a group. And to be honest, at that point, I was pretty much on the brink of deleting my Facebook account for, you know, reasons which don't need to be elaborated here. Uh, <laughs> I think I think many people have the same reasons. <laughs> Absolutely. I was so sick of Facebook. I was so sick of it. And I was just desperate to get off it. And then this thing happened. And I thought, there will be a point, and it may come in a week, and it may come in a month, but there will be a point well, where you know we might need people to do shopping for us. We might, might need people to take each other to the hospital. I just had no idea just how bad it would get. And in the end, of course, it didn't get anywhere near as bad as that, at least back in the spring. Um, and so I started it for that reason, thinking it would be great just to have a little group, maybe 10, 20 friends. I was literally thinking 20, 30 friends, um, friends and acquaintances, and perhaps me with my, you know, because I do have access to not only information, but also people. I can call, say, the um, Minister of the Interior on his cell phone. I can even call the Prime Minister. I, I don't do it very often, but I do sometimes text him, you know, just for a quote. And I'm not sure, I'm not showing off, I'm not I'm just showing off a bit. I do genuinely have access to um, information at source, and uh, I can quickly uh, separate the wheat from the chaff and say, okay, no, this is not true you know this sounds scary but it's not that scary and so exactly as you say um, uh, a clearinghouse for reliable uh, official or at least verifiable information about covid but also a sort of neighborhood hence the help your hood bit a uh, group where we could all help each other in, in the event of of the calamity that we assumed covid would be but but I, I really genuinely presumed and thought and conceived of it as something that would be maybe for 20 30 maximum 50 people living in the Chishkov vinohradi area of Prague. And now you have 3,412 people. Exactly. Go figure. <laughs> How did that happen? I don't, I still don't know. I think it's just, you know, in, in, in the noise, in the noise of COVID, I think it's, I think a lot of people really do appreciate hearing, you know, information in, 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 in bullet points, information that is reliable, that, you know, and there is a lot of humor and, and uh, uh, Mickey taking <laughs> on the page as well. Just a place of calm where we're not shouting at each other, where we're civil to each other, where we're having a rational debate, where we're deleting people saying, I've heard they're closing the borders. I've heard they're closing the borders. They're going to do it on Tuesday, right? That stuff gets deleted for a reason because it just echoes and it just it just rattles around this big echo chamber that social media has become and it makes people anxious and terrified and it's counterproductive so our page is much more a place where just you come to find something which is true which is reliable which is you know generally 99% of the time accurate often from source or at least from um, Czech media and translated well and then sometimes will make you laugh but always will make you feel better. Hmm. That's that's quite admirable, I would think. Because, you know, I know Martin Howling at uh, expats.cz, he started uh, a Facebook group about uh, COVID-19 and all of that stuff a little bit before you did your Help Your Hood group. Yeah, absolutely. No, I had no ambition to, to compete with um, expats or Martin at all. You know, he's, he's also in the group. He's, he's a friend. You know, I watched him in the early days. First, it was open and anybody could post. And then you started getting and I, you never know. Are these are these people who are panicking? Are they actual trolls who are purposely trying to see dissent and panic and anxiety? It's hard to tell. Are they just, you know, kids who think it's funny to mess with people? But you would see just these ridiculous stuff up there. And then he would shut it, basically say, okay, posts need to be approved. But then, you know, that's a lot of work. And then, so it's, a, I mean, how much work does this, how much of your day is spent doing this? It's a huge amount of work, way too much. Um, it's it's a huge amount of work. It's, as I say, you know, with those modest ambitions, I really thought uh, I would just be doing this myself uh, an hour a day. When I was spending eight, nine, ten hours a day on it, uh, that's when I put out my little cry for help, for people to help moderate it. And so now I have a brilliant team. There have been about, I think, a 
dozen, maybe 15 people who have or who are currently moderating the content, uh, helping to write the content, monitoring press conferences. So we've basically become a little kind of voluntary news agency and support group, staffed and run, obviously, by volunteers for nothing except for kudos and maybe a few beers when it's all over. So, I mean, that's quite a that's quite a, a little crew of people who are volunteering their time to help you. And some of them don't even live in Prague, it seems. Yeah, I mean, we have people uh, in Brno. We have um, people who sort of come and go from other places. So, yeah, it's a pretty diverse crew. Um, but they've just been absolutely amazing in helping me to, you know, turn this thing into what it's become, which is obviously way more uh, ambitious and way bigger than than the little Facebook self-help group that I started back in March. So again, I can't say enough just how grateful I am to them for volunteering their time. They've been absolutely awesome. Do you think this is going to continue through this whole pandemic? I imagine so. Uh, I mean, I do get a bit of stick for trying to sort of, uh, or joking that I I was going to, uh, you know, looking to close the group down, I think around about uh, July, August, and it didn't happen for obvious reasons. But I was seriously thinking around September time, okay, that's that's it. You know, it was fun. It was a fun ride. We did it. We did it. Uh, we beat the virus. Mission accomplished. Obviously, that didn't happen. And I say that as someone who was on Charles Bridge in a professional capacity, I have to say, at that infamous dinner party. Ah, uh, yeah. So for people that don't know, uh, they had a, God, how many people was it? Uh, I think about 2,000 people turned up in the end. Right. So 2,000 people. 500 places. Yeah, 500 places. They lined up tables end to end all along the Charles Bridge going across the river and had a big dinner party with no masks and social distancing to celebrate that the Czechs had beaten COVID-19. Well, not quite. That's the international media version, Derek. I must correct you. Ah, please do. I must correct you because the invite on Facebook said something like to celebrate the end of this difficult period of lockdown. So if there was one thing it wasn't, and I interviewed all the organizers on that day and, and, and since... Uh, it wasn't to sort of do a kind of mission accomplished thing uh, to celebrate the, the defeat of the virus. It was spectacularly bad, uh, you know, messaging and, and an incredible display of hubris. But it was a, so much fun. And it really you felt the spirit of this city being on that bridge on that beautiful summer evening. And everybody there, I think, felt the same thing. It was stupid, of course. I think most people now would look back on it and thinking, what were we thinking? But I think, you know, a couple of things to point out that it wasn't really a yes, we'd be the virus party it absolutely was not the second thing it was all absolutely legal and it was conducted according to all the regulations in place in prague at that time and frankly there is not an epidemiologist on earth who would say that there were any infections from that event itself the bridge thing has is 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 one of those things that's just uh, it's a dead horse that's not only been flogged but you know is is sort of uh, reanimated resuscitated every week in on social media and uh, it's i think the point has been made and now we're back in it so maybe we'll have another party we will i'm organizing it as we speak i'm not i'm not Here we are, we're all living here, checks, non-checks. The same people who did such a great job in March and April and May and even June before this this dinner party announcing sort of the, the end of lockdown. And by the same people, I mean the politicians and I also mean the citizens. Now that we've got, I guess it's probably second wave hitting us now and we're the worst country in Europe, the same people are doing a phenomenally bad job. What, how is it different? Um, for a start, there are uh, epidemiologists here who say it's simply wrong to talk about a second wave in the Czech Republic when you never had a first, right? So what we had in spring was nothing for a multitude of reasons. Um, the response of the public, the response of the authorities, the profile of the population, the speed with which they closed the borders, a million things contributed to the fact that what happened in spring here uh, when the Czechs dodged a bullet uh, was not really an epidemic in, in itself. Uh, in fact, epidemiologists say don't use the word epidemic 
pandemic to describe the COVID situation in this country in spring because the numbers don't even equal um, epidemic uh, levels. I think for it's largely pointless to talk about a first wave and a second wave to describe what happened in spring and what happened in now. Uh, it, this is the wave, you know, th- this is the epidemic. This is what's happening now. So that's one thing. And then the second thing, I think I would just <laughs> perhaps even if I may just refer you to one post that we had earlier this week. Uh, it referred to an article that appeared on Seznam Spravi, uh, one of the sort of main news service in, in the Czech Republic, in which they described what happened in spring. Um, they took it from a forthcoming book, which I cannot wait to read. It's called Pandemia, Pandemic by Seznam's uh, Wojciech Gibish and Czech TV's Michal Kubal. And in it, they describe the inside story of the pandemic and the epidemic in the Czech Republic. They described one episode, one anecdote, one incident that I think tells us everything um, about where we are now and where we were and why we are where we are now. And that incident was uh, that a private individual um, who's an insurance executive uh, was sitting at home, you know, watching the news coming from Italy. He had a spreadsheet. He had access to the same data that we all did, data that was being shared in the media from Italy. And being a guy who deals with numbers and figures and ratios and risk and all the rest of it, he, in an, in Excel, literally did a model of what would happen here within days. He is obviously, as a very senior insurance executive, he headed Ceska Pojstovna, the insurance company. Uh, he managed to get through to the sort of higher echelons of the Czech government. And within a few days, he was sitting in a meeting room with the interior minister, Jan Hamacek, and various heads of, you know, the police and the fire brigade and so on. And he basically stood up and said, okay, look, this is what's happened in Italy one week ago. This is where they are now. This is what's happened here in this country two days ago. This is where we'll be in another two. And this is where we'll be in four. And after two days, after his predictions perfectly matched the reality, that spreadsheet was on the desk of the prime minister. And within days, you know, the, the borders were closed and we were all present, prevented from going outside and we're all wearing masks. Really? It was because of that one guy who took it upon himself to go to the Czech government and say, you need to get a grip on this. That's amazing. And they did it and they admitted it. Uh, Jan Hamacek, Andrei Babish, all of these people say, have referred to this mysterious person. They've done that in the early days of the epidemic. They said a, a private individual came to us and showed us modeling and we acted. They didn't identify him because he he wanted to remain anonymous. He's now come forward for this book. So now we know who he is and we know his name. But the most terrifying thing, and this is I'm now entering the outer reaches of what I can say as an impartial observer of Czech politics and life, is that Andrei Babish was asked recently when things were going wrong, why didn't the government reintroduce tougher measures in August, so six weeks after the bridge party, when it was clear that the numbers were rising again. If we'd done that, we wouldn't have been in this mess. Why didn't you do it? And he said, because no one came to us. No one brought us a spreadsheet in August, right? So basically, you ask why we are in such a mess now, we escaped that mess in spring because some guy at home was watching TV and had Excel on his computer and managed to get his modeling to the prime minister of this country who acted. We're in the mess now because that didn't happen in August. And that is terrifying. Well, I think there there are two questions that pop into my mind, which is number one, could they not just have used the same modeling? I'm sure it was very similar. And two, in the intervening months, did they not think, you know what, maybe we should get a team of people together to do what this guy did in an evening in his home? They have all that. They have all those people. And I cannot possibly tell you why the people who modeled this didn't see this coming. Or rather, perhaps the question is, surely they did see it coming. Surely it was shown to the right people. Why didn't they act. I could not possibly speculate why that didn't happen. I don't even begin to have that kind of knowledge or access, but it didn't. Well, you know, uh, the New York Times had an article back in, I don't know when, somewhere in the summer, maybe before the summer, saying there are two ways for a country to deal with this pandemic. You can throw money at it or you can throw bodies at it. Because we did the lockdown. We did it very fast. As you say, we avoided the first wave. We're getting the first wave now. But 
it really did kind of mess with the economy in in a lot of ways that we're still trying to figure out, I think. So maybe they were trying to balance it somehow. Maybe. And and it's also, to be fair to, to Andrei Babish and, and the Czech government, there are many thousands of people doing a sterling job and trying to the best of their abilities to stop people dying and to save the economy. And, and to, to be fair to them, there are <laughs> countries everywhere in Europe who are dealing with exactly this same dilemma right now, including the most advanced um, economies of the world. It's a problem and it's a situation situation that, that so many countries are grappling with. I don't think any really have a kind of magic bullet, although obviously some have done better and have been more farsighted than others. True. I, I know some people are disappointed that there's not better pan-European coordination. Yeah, I'm one of them. Yeah, right. I do have to kind of wonder, what are you doing, Brussels? Like, why are you leaving it up to each individual country? Yeah, no, but you can't, you see. You can't, you can't lay that accusation at their door because that's not how the EU works. You can't simultaneously say, what are you doing, Brussels, and why hasn't there been more coordinated action? People say that, but then they're often the same people who are absolutely against the European Union having uh, any more power to act unilaterally without the consent of all of its 28 members. Oh, sorry, 27 now that we've left. So without without that centralised power, they can't act like that. Um, they can make recommendations and they can have meetings and all the rest of it. But at the end of the day, the EU is, I was going to say the EU is not the US, but even in the US, as you well know, you know, different states do different things. And Trump says, you know, you need to do this. You, How dare you do that? You have to open this and you have to close that. And the governor or the, or the, you know, the people in charge will say no. So countries and organizations like the European Union in this situation have obviously had huge problems in, in acting in a sort of singular, resolute, single way. And it is interesting. It's interesting to see how uh, weak a lot of our, or how fragile perhaps, or precariously balanced a lot of our systems turned out to be, you know. Uh, right now, for example, we can have this conversation over Zoom and when people can work remotely and you can study remotely. But if you're a waiter or a waitress, how are you supposed to survive? You know, you can't, you can't really wait tables over Zoom. No, absolutely not. I made that <laughs> very same comment just this morning um, when I got my hair cut. I don't have much hair left to cut, but I went for a haircut. Um, and my hairdresser was saying, oh, you know, it's and she's lucky her boyfriend has a, has a, has a, a fairly steady job. Um, but she's now beginning to worry again for the second time this year whether she's going to survive and whether her business is going to survive. Um, because, you know, you can't cut hair over Zoom. It's going to be interesting. I think that this is going to transform a lot of... Uh uh, institutions, a lot of systems. I think we're going to see a lot of changes this time next year. I think we'll be very surprised by how different things have become. People say that. And then also, equally, people say, no, in a year or whenever, when there's a vaccine or whatever, in a year, two years, we'll be right back to, you know, polluting our oceans and our air and, and buying too much crap that we don't need. Um, and we will be right back where we are traveling to places that just to do, you know, photos for Instagram. We will be completely uh, unchanged by this experience. Let's assume, again, it's all very nebulous and God knows we don't know what's going to happen. But let's assume by the end of next summer, everything's settled down. There's a vaccine. Yes, the thing mutates very quickly, but we figured out, let's assume we figured out how to deal with that. And, and that's that. By that time, looking at just the growth of your Help Your Hood group on Facebook over just a few months, I'm going to assume you're going to have far more people by then. What happens then? Do you think you might turn it into something else? I mean, like you kind of said, you've almost created a sort of a grassroots news agency here. I, uh, I really don't know. I just don't know. I just don't know. It's been a huge amount of fun. It's been hugely enjoyable. And as I keep stressing to people when they, you know, uh, insist on thanking me effusively for what I'm doing, uh, and it, and it, obviously I, it gives me a great deal of satisfaction and pleasure, but I also find it intensely embarrassing. But what I always say is that I do this because it helps me process the information, the same information that I then um, send to the BBC, or often it's even the other way around, but it helps me process all this stuff. If I understand it for you guys, if I've read it, if I've summed it up, if I've put it in bullet points, if I've made it funny and 
uh, witty or whatever, then it just it's so much easier for me to talk about either on air, on TV or on radio or write an article on it because I've processed that information and I've checked it out. So it's, you know, it's not all altruism. I will <laughs> make that clear from the outset. But what to do in, a, in, in a six months or a year's time when it's all over? Who knows? Who knows? Maybe someone could buy it from me for a, for a large sum of money. I'll, how about that? I'll sell it. I'll sell it to you, Derek. Help Your Hood. I will sell Help Your Hood to you. Name your price. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the, uh, where did you come up with the name? Because, you know, there is a hashtag help your hood organization out there. Are you affiliated with that or did you just come up with it all on your own? Is there? All I thought of that all on my own. I got no idea. I, I stole a photo off Google. I thought of the name. I, I have no idea how it came to me or why. I don't know. It just came to me. This is something that I very much love about Prague in general that certainly I've seen in the last uh, 10 years is a lot of stuff happens at this grassroots citizen level. And like you said, mm, that granular level, yeah. Yeah, it's it's really quite amazing. And I, I think part of it is because this is one of those cities where the citizens are they're paying attention. They're not just living their lives that they happen to be here. They're paying attention to the city. They're actively involved in the city and the country and the society. It just seems to be part of the Czech mentality and the Czech makeup. And it's an astonishing story that we staved off the worst of it in the spring because of a single guy. Well, uh, let's just hope that everybody continues to pay attention and uh, there's more innovation and more, um, dare I call it, activism uh, in the weeks and months to come as we all try and get through this period. Uh, I'd like to thank you for talking to me today, sir. Thank you very much, Derek. I'm simultaneously pleased, proud, and slightly embarrassed. Well, you are British. That's very true. That's one thing I cannot deny. Thanks a lot. No, really, it was a pleasure. All right. Thank you uh, for talking to me today. Uh, check the episode description for links to Help Your Hood and other sources that we've talked about on this episode. And thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of Prague Times. If you liked this episode, be sure to like it or share it and tell your friends. Check us out on all of our social media platforms for extra goodies as well. Until next time, this has been Prague Times.